everybody, and welcome to another episode of God is on a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Pemberton, and on today's episode, we have a very special guest who uh, Ken will give us a wonderful intro for as uh, as he's handpicked her to be on our, our show to uh, to be introduced to all of you. So Ken, why don't you tell us who we've got today? All right. I am really excited to have Joan Lynch on our uh, on our podcast, although I've known her so long, I still may inadvertently refer to her as Joni Lynch. Um, now, Ken, remember my new name now. Uh, that's true. She's no longer Lynch either. She's uh, She's been remarried since the passing of her husband, Bill Lynch. Um, I knew Bill and Joni when they were at the Anaheim Vineyard a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, it was it was near the end of the last century um, and at the end of the last millennium. And uh, they left our fellowship to go plant churches in. They didn't. I don't I don't know how targeted you were. I don't remember it clearly. You can clarify anything I say here. But as I recall, you were going to go, quote, to the East Block. And you'd been studying Russian with Berlitz language courses. Nowadays, we use Duolingo uh, before you went. And you ultimately landed not in Russia, but in Ukraine, which is in everybody's mind these days. And you had a huge revival in Ukraine that you and your former husband led. Um, She's now married to a man named Greg since the passing of her husband, uh, her first husband. But anyway, uh, Bill and Joni had this huge revival in Ukraine and it spread beyond Ukraine and went into other parts of what was the East Bloc. And we're going to talk about that revival and what it was like to be uh, in place for all of that today. Joni, welcome to our show. Oh, it's so nice. Thank you for having me. This is really a pleasure. (laughs) Now, let's start out with your early history. People always want to know the story of how did you get to where you were? So you and Bill came to faith and you were involved in something in the latter stages of the Jesus movement called Shiloh. Most of our listeners will have no concept of what Shiloh is other than, of course, this site in the Bible. Talk to us about Shiloh. Talk to us about your own coming to faith, how Bill came to faith and how the two of you met and ended up on this wild journey to the back of beyond and saw God move. (laughs) <laughs> well, um, Bill's journey to faith and his testimony is about an eight hour story, which you know very well, Ken, and, and that I couldn't get into all the length of it, but he was writing the book. And I really feel like the Lord is going to make it into a movie. The book's name is Peace, Love, Drugs and Enlightenment. And it's about him as a young hippie traveling all around the world, having these supernatural experiences with God that were just literally supernatural. We're talking about encounters with gurus, um, just um, miraculous interventions of God sparing his life, getting imprisoned in Kabul for smuggling drugs, how God delivered him from there. This is a big, long story. I My story was simpler. I was a young hippie teenager girl. My sister told me about Jesus. I thought this sounded really nice. I got saved really young and early as a very young teenager hippie. And Bill and I married and met in the Virgin Islands. Shiloh at that time had a house. Uh, so Shiloh was a, a Christian communal movement that came out of Calvary Chapel and out of Lonnie Frisbee. Lonnie Frisbee had the House of Miracles down there in Southern Cal. Mm-hmm. And so this movement, and they had Christian commune houses all across the U.S., Canada, and then St. Thomas was later on. And all of us were hitchhiking around. And so hitchhikers that were hippies, they could get a free place to stay, crash there. We would preach the gospel to them. And so many people came to Christ through this. It was a real Jesus movement, you know, long hair, hippie kind of thing. We were radically discipled in this this environment. Um, No movies, no books, no periodicals, no TV, really intense Bible, intensive discipleship on the streets every night, preaching the gospel. It was, it was a guess. It was great. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So you guys are authentic Jesus people movement. People keep saying there's going to be a, another Jesus movement. 
what are your thoughts on that? Do you, do you think there is another one brewing from what you're seeing, or do you think it'll be something very different? Well, we can tell, and I wish Bill was here because he would answer these questions better. If you study scripture and he studied revival, he was a real revival historian. Mm -hmm. The, oh, sorry, my, there, um, things don't repeat. God always does something new and fresh. And so it, I don't even really, um, I would love it to see a new Jesus movement, but I have a feeling that God is going to do something totally new. And I don't really care for that terminology of another Jesus movement, although I agree with it. I think God always does something new and fresh for every generation. That's what we hope for, you know? Right. Yeah. I'm all game. All right. So the, the Jesus people movement is kind of in its latter days when you and Bill, um, are drawn into the revival when you meet and marry. How did you guys find your way to the Anaheim Vineyard? Although at the time you first showed up, it was the Yorpalinda Vineyard. So all Bill and I's life together was all led through prophetic words and visions. And back in these days, we're talking like 78, we got married. He took a year off from full-time ministry like the scripture says. And so we found ourselves in Park City, Utah in 1979, praying around the time of our first year anniversary. And we went to this little Calvary Chapel believers meeting, which was kind of like an afterglow meeting where we waited on the Holy Spirit. But back then we had no idea what prophecies were or visions. And some people in the meeting had, there was two visions. One vision was an iron gate and an iron wall the second vision was a palm tree in a yard that had a chain link fence. And we received those two visions as divine direction. And the first one was a confirmation for us. Um, we felt to go to we the iron curtain, and the iron wool, we felt was God showing us what we were going to do as a couple that we should go into the iron curtain. So Bill, at that point, so that was 79, in the spring of 1980, he went in to the Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain uh, in one of those super spy car things with all these secret compartments. He was chased by the KGB. There's a lot of amazing stories. But then something happened in Prague, uh, Czechoslovakia. It was an underground meeting, interdenominational, and the dispensational interpreter didn't want to translate the word that this old Pentecostal grandma had for Bill, but it was, uh, it was really a right on word. She said, the Lord has called you over here. You're a little early, go home and wait for further instructions, which kind of dev devastated us at that point. Cause we were so young and zealous. We were going to, you know, turn the whole world on fire for Jesus, you know, back then. But um, so that was our initial um so that was 80 he took in that he went to that trip and then when the wall came down in 89 that was a real critical pivotal move moment for us we were pastoring in park city utah now in between 80 and 89 oh okay so the other vision was a palm tree in this yard with this chain link fence and we just immediately felt that we should move to Southern California. We were in Park City. All of uh, Park City at the time were 40% transplants from Southern Cal. They're saying, no, don't go down there. It's a jungle. And we went just on nothing but a word. Actually, Bill and I moved almost constantly. The first 20 years of our marriage, we moved 19 times, just trying to hear from the Holy Spirit and go and do and go see where God's moving and be where the, the Lord was moving. So we hit um, went to Southern Cal in fall of 1980, and we started hearing reports from close friends about the Lord, this beautiful thing that was happening in Yorba Linda with some like worship, some really good worship. And so we went, and then, then you know this story with John Wimber's, um, the revival hit, they went from 200 people to 3,000, what, six months, and you know, all that's history. And we were there for that time. And that really was uh, formulated us on our path. We knew we were going to be in missions and we felt like we were getting really trained in the Holy Spirit there with some really important things. And so the day comes when you guys 
are feeling like it's time to go. Of course, the Iron Curtain had fallen <clears throat> in 1989. Yes, 89. And, and now it was no longer, you know, you're going to get chased by the KGB. Although, as I remember it, when you guys got to Ukraine, um, you did have to deal with some oligarchs and local thugs and gangsters. It wasn't like, hey, the coast is clear. Don't worry about anything. But Oh, the, it was it was very difficult. Lots of yeah. warfare. And so you go and you've had some some experience pastoring in Park City. Um, I, I remember that you'd done some language training and you're about as ready as you're going to be. But you get thrown into the deep end of the tank. Talk to us about your story of going first to Moscow and then coming down ultimately to Ukraine and even there ultimately to Kharkiv or Kharkov, I think is the way yeah. you used to say it. What was that like? And how, tell us about some of the hardship. We always hear the glory stories. Tell oh, us about yeah. what was really hard about this. Well, there was plenty of hardships. And one of my main scriptures back then was endure hardship as a good soldier in Christ. So I was, I was gun ho. We had a handicapped daughter we took into the field. People thought we were crazy. Uh, we landed in Moscow, October 8th, 1992 on my daughter, Christy's birthday, which was how we never forgot that, but we did not stay in Moscow. We felt led and we were directed to go up to Kostroma, Russia. And at that place there, we helped a pastor there and we did, um, the altar calls. I mean, the, the mass of people getting saved and flooding the altar calls, Hardship wise, it was very cold. We're talking minus 25 degrees. We're talking very cold. And um, hardship wise was lots of hardships. I had a handicapped daughter in diapers. There was no diaper. There was no pampers in the entire country. You know, you have faulty pipes, bad water, washing machines that overflow to the downstairs neighbors with all the diarrhea diapers. You know, we're talking dysentery, losing I think I lost 60 pounds in the first four weeks because of dysentery. And, you know, there's just mission life is wrought with some wonderful <laughs> difficulties. You know, <laughs> our six year old daughter just kept taking off and going to be with friends, newfound friends. She was very uh, wanderlust like her father. And, you know, you, you're there two weeks, you hardly know the language. And then your daughter, who's six years old, just dis disappears <laughs> for hours. <laughs> She was at some apartment in the apartment building having tea with some nice little girl, you know, and <laughs> crazy stuff. Um, back then, I would say that it was physically difficult just to stay warm enough. You had to wear those big fur hats. You wore big fur lined boots. You know, if you're standing at, at, a, at, a, at a bus stop trying to get somewhere and you're standing for 45 minutes in minus 25 degree weather with these Siberian blasts, it's dang cold. It's very cold. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, but it was worth it, right? Oh, I was loving it. I enjoyed every minute of it. Um, the altar calls and the fl floods of people flooding, flooding the altar. Uh, my son, John, was only like eight years old. And he said, Dad. In two months, you've prayed with over 200 people to accept Christ. It takes you two years in America to one, win one neighbor to the Lord, you know, if that. And so the, the harvest was on and the door was open and God, you know, Bill, the Lord had told Bill, this is a real crucial part. While we were at the revival at John Wimber's, Bill had an open vision and he was not one to like, fall out under the power of the Holy Spirit, although he ministered that and many people would get touched when he would minister, but he had a real strong constitution, big, strong, you know, you know, football looking guy. He didn't just weekly, weekly fall out on the power, but this incredible force came upon him in one of the meetings where John Wimber was having there. I think that was in your Belinda. And he was literally crushed. He felt like he was getting crushed like a tin can and he went under the stage and uh, the reports, I, I, don't, I can't remember, I don't think I was there, but I was somewhere getting touched somewhere in the, built, in the room. He was rolling and moaning and he saw this open vision and he saw the Soviet Union and he saw the um, hammer and the sickle. 
And the Lord showed him, I'm going to hammer this whole place and break it up. And then I'm going to harvest it with the sickle. And this is exactly what happened in the former Soviet Union. The Lord broke that, that Soviet empire. He broke it up, which was a shock to everyone. Nobody believed that the great Soviet empire could ever get broken up like this. This was a really supernatural thing. But prior to us going over there, the Lord gave Bill a special prayer to break the back of the stronghold of the Soviet Union. And this prayer was very important. I only know of one other person who got a, a prayer similar. And this was back in that waiting period. We waited like nine years. And um, he was tight-lipped about sharing this prayer. It was a private thing, but later on he did divulge it. And the Lord showed him to pray, to break the back of the serpent over the Soviet Union and set the people free. And when he had this open vision, the Lord showed him the thing breaking up and then all of these people getting set free. And it was almost like, almost like hordes of people coming out of mental institutions and people getting like released from prison doors, like literally. And he said, the Lord showed him there was three things that were going to be needed, salvation for souls, deep inner healing. And then the third thing, which really surprised Bill was how to live in a free open market economy and to teach them that. And Bill like stopped the Lord and said, Oh Lord, you know, that's, that's kind of silly. That's, you know, that's about money. And the Lord corrected him and said, you don't know. I am deeply interested in every aspect of people's life. I'm interested in them learning how to make money on them for themselves yeah. work. And so we, that was one of the pieces later in Ukraine, we did have micro business, micro enterprise. We trained people, uh, that was later on, but, and then there was another prophetic dream Bill had during the time we were in the revival at John Wimbers. It was very crucial. This was in 1984 and uh, we can never forget it because it really came to pass. He saw two train tracks, one on each side parallel. And at a certain point they intersected. And at the intersection point, he saw a photo of my oldest daughter, my oldest child, Annie, she was just looking like she was getting into puberty age. And the Lord told him, when she looks like this, you will move to Ukraine. And the Holy Spirit told Bill, when Annie looks like this and you move to Ukraine, it would be better for a school age child that age to live. No, no, you would live. You would move to Russia. We started off in Russia. And the Holy Spirit said it would be better to be a school child pupil in a Russian school than to be in the American school system. And when we left and Annie would look like that, that's when all those school shootings started in America it was soon after we left the country. Wow. And this some, a lot of real specific bill was very supernaturally led by the, uh, he really heard from the Lord. He had a deep relationship with the Lord and his whole life really was supernatural. His conversion, which is very lengthy, he had a real supernatural life and a, and a supernatural call. And I, I felt like it was a great privilege to serve him in his call, you know, and, and to work alongside of him. Right. So I, I was called as well. I had a prophetic word happen to me when I was 15 years old in biology class. The Lord told me specifically, I was just a young, brand new convert. The Lord told me you will be in revival or having to do with revival before or around revival from this point on in your life for your entire life around the whole globe. And, and it really happened. It, it happened. Yeah. It's happening. So I think these stories that you're telling are fascinating because, um, you know, I grew up reading missionary stories that talked about the hardships of the mission field. And, you know, people used to make jokes when I was in college university about being MT tough, missionary training tough. Oh and, yeah. <laughs> you know, so they would eat these various concoctions and say, well, it's not appealing, but it's food. And, you know, when you're on the mission field, you gotta be, you gotta be tough and ready. And so, you know, that was kind of the old paradigm of missions and, you know, the yeah. missionaries would go to the field and they would bring all of their belongings with them in a coffin so that when they died, they would have something in which to be buried. I mean, this is this, this is the stuff that oh, all yeah. you have to do is read books like C.T. Studd, Cricketeer and Pioneer, or yeah. I don't know. There's a number of these books around, but you know, you read these books and you hear this stuff and you think, "Wow, that's that's really rough." But then, 
the paradigm started changing and now it was the new era of modern missions and you could be uh you know living in a skyscraper in some city somewhere and have all the comforts of america you didn't know the language maybe and you know there's cultural things to adapt to but all that hardship goes away but you're back you're throwing us back into that era of wow there's this real hardship and yet there was also the blessing of being there knowing you were sent there by god and that you had a mission to accomplish we you might know, be nothing yeah. less than the conversion of a nation you know conditions vary times change the conditions don't mean anything the conditions are totally immaterial. What is matters is the souls and whatever it takes to go after those souls. And everybody has their different methods and everybody has their different comfort zones and styles. You know, I knew missionaries that lived much more comfortably than we, and every, that's their call, but that's immaterial. It's the spiritual souls. It's going after the souls and whatever it takes uh, to live amongst them, to be among them. And uh, like, we wanted to be like them. We thought, oh, because we read those stories. Oh, we'll buy a Soviet made washing machine. Well, what a joke. I mean, it tore up, it ripped all of Bill's underwear in the first month. He had no underwear after a month because the Soviet <laughs> washer just ripped them all up into shreds. And, and so after dealing with this washing machine that literally overflowed into my downstairs neighbor's apartment. I didn't know any Russian in this large woman who was as wide as she was tall, knocks on my door and says going, cup, 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 And we had to hire a girl to sit next to the washing machine and put the hose in and wash the clothes all day long. We had to hire her. So after this, we thought, you know, it's really not smart for us to try to live like these locals. They hate the way they live. Even the local soldiers, they said, you're Americans. We're not expecting you to live this crappy lifestyle like we have. This is horrible. So we eventually finally found it, which took years, of course. And then there's more <laughs> washing stories. <laughs> you, you know, there's all these crazy stories, but you get through it. it you know, you're resilient. You, I did realize something that you can, you can live with anything. You can handle anything, you know, it just, it's your attitude. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can only imagine living through that, but, but literally hearing these stories, I think it's important for our listeners to, to hear these things because there is also at times a sacrifice required to carry out whatever mission oh, yeah. you're given. Anyone who's in the military knows that. And the well, scripture talks about, you know, yes. no soldier wants to entangle himself in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer, et cetera. And so well, yeah, I, and think, I, I think in our time, we've become habituated to the idea that um, we're just going to waltz in and it's all going to fall in our ah. laps. <laughs> oh, what a joke. Now, I downplayed it a lot. I had a handicapped daughter who had muscular issues. She could not walk up steps. We lived on the fifth floor of an apartment. I'd have to carry Sarah on my hip. You had to go get your groceries and carry your groceries. So the Soviet diet plan, it works. If you carry all your groceries that your family needs to eat a mile or so and walk up five flights of <laughs> apartments to get all of your food into your house, you will lose weight. You will. And so <laughs> I Sarah on one hip and this big, bag of groceries on another probably about 40 pounds and you're going up five flights of steps and you're doing that you know every few days because you have a family of four and you, you need to eat and so um you know at that time we didn't have a vehicle we eventually did get a vehicle and bill was trying to live like the natives so he was going to the church or to functions on the, the uh the trolley buses and he realized it took 45 minutes on the trolley bus which was a, a five minute drive in a car. And so eventually we did get a vehicle and, you know, things did get easier, but, um, but then there was other hardships too. Um, I mean, you can get used to those conditions, but there's always going to be a new hardship that's going to hit you in the face. <laughs> I remember specifically, cause you know, I was getting your prayer letters through all this time and, you know, we would send money to help support you. But I remember um, specifically one, one story of how all the steam in the city 
was controlled from a central plant and you literally could not control when you had heat in your apartment. It was when the authorities determined that you would have it and it was for only a couple hours a day. They'd heat up the apartment and it might get so hot you couldn't stand it. But then the when they shut off the steam, the buildings weren't insulated. And so the cold would seep in and you'd be wearing your babushka hats and the heavy coats and everything right there in your apartment because it was the only way to survive in the cold. Yes. Yes. Now in Ukraine, when we had our meetings in Ukraine and Ukraine had separated away from Russia, Russia was very brutal against the Ukrainians and cut off their gas. And so in our meetings, when we started our meetings in 93 in Ukraine, Kharkiv, there was no heat in our meeting halls. It was so freezing cold in the meeting halls that um, I'm a worship leader singer. We had to wear gloves because if you didn't have a glove, when you held the, the metal microphone, your hand would stick to the microphone. It was that cold. And you had to wear all these incredible. I, I started learning about the different types of wool and fur hats and um, people would come under their fur coats and they were so hungry for the gospel though bill would be up on the stage shivering and he'd say well is that enough and they go no no keep preaching some more and we would just be in those freezing conditions and the power of god was so strong and people were so hungry they, they just wanted to hear more you know it, it was freezing it was so cold you could see your breath coming out of your mouth <laughs> <laughs> I remember as well, um, at one point talking with Bill, um, I don't think this was ever in a newsletter, but you guys were having some trouble with some, they, they had been, I think, communist officials, but the Soviet Union had broken up. And so these guys were still in power. They just were no longer representing the Soviet Union. They were representing themselves. And they became, I think, the beginnings of what today are known as the oligarchs uh, in in those countries but anyway these guys were these were not nice people and they were oh. threatening you guys and yeah, yeah. tell oh, us yeah. a little bit about what it was like to deal with that kind of government apparatus well you know our phones were tapped the kgb was listening to us and when i found that out i uh and I, my russian got good enough i just preached every time i was on the phone i'd say my dear brothers <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about Jesus, you know, and and there was snitches and spies in the um, playgrounds um, watching us. There was a lady who was a snitch spy in the playground watching, you know, all the activities going on in our home, our apartment at that time. And then there was some real uh, we had a wonderful big team come over from America. And uh, at that time, they were actually arresting um, people doing crusades and teams. And we had to get our team out of the building and get them like kind of like clandestinely get them away from the meeting hall because then these thugs came in and wanted to see where, where these Americans were and were arrested them. The church we did in uh, Ukraine, we did grow to a really large size. And so this is the classic thing they do in Ukraine. They've did this to other churches in Kiev as well you rent or lease this big monstrosity Soviet building. And then you start remodeling it because you're thinking like Americans do, we have a contract, we're renting, we're leasing. I'm going to fix this up. Well, as soon as you fix it up and you get it to a pretty nice standard, they just kick you out and you have no recourse whatsoever. And so we got kicked out. We got this really big, huge halls, one of the largest halls in Kharkiv at the time. And the Lord was moving and we were up to over a thousand people and God that's the next story, right? The revival. But on Christmas Day, very, the very day of Christmas, on our Christmas service, the thugs came in and just literally kicked us out of our hall on Christmas Day. And so, you know, there's some, they, um, and they were going after us and going after Bill. So we did have to hire a lawyer and the lawyer would go in. The Department of Religious Affairs was the old Soviet department where they would persecute the ministers. And so they tried to go after us but the lord would always thwart them and so we found out that to legally live there in ukraine you had to be a student so we got a student visa and uh, i originally studied russian in uh, garden grove community college in 1982 uh preparing for the ukraine i did uh, for arts you know later and i did really well there actually i was a ukrainian 
teacher there, professor. So then later we became students in the Kharkov State University to study Russian in the preparatory faculty for foreign students. At the time when we went there, which was 93, this was the terrorist training center for the whole Soviet Union. They would bring young terrorists into this university to train them in Russian to later train them in terrorism. And oh. so in our classroom was future terrorists from these Muslim nations. <laughs> it was wild. And um, the classrooms were freezing. There wasn't any heat. You had to bring your own little personal electric heaters or something. And um, oh, it was a wild time. I'm getting off track. So help me here. <laughs> <laughs> but this adds a lot of color and a lot of context to everything we're talking about i think it's i think it's actually quite relevant and you know people have no idea because we yeah. were living in america and america has been a land of abundance and plenty and you know when we think you know we we hear about those that are underprivileged and all that people in america who are underprivileged might be deemed rich in comparison to what was going on in ukraine in those years and yes. so everything's relative and People need to hear about folks like you and Bill, who's with the Lord now, who literally laid your lives on the line in order to preach the gospel, in order to be his servants among a people who didn't know him at all. Yes. And, you know, Jesus, he endured the cross and the suffering of the shame of the cross for the joy that was set before him. And I asked the Lord about this because it was very, it was, it was very tough, the suffering. And I said, Lord, what's that joy? I need to know what that joy was that's set before you so I can get through this. And he showed me there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. And we have to tap into the supernatural joy of the Lord. The joy that motivated Jesus was one sinner in heaven that repents. And, and I'll tell you that this is, this is what helped me just keep going for it and keep pressing. You know, I press on towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of Christ Jesus. There's a lot of pressing. And I'll tell you, it felt like there that you were pushing. Bill and I would read our own newsletters to try to encourage ourselves. It felt literally that you were in, you were in thigh high, thick mud all the time, just pushing, pushing, pushing. It was, mm -hmm. it was extremely difficult. Yeah. Very difficult. But praise the Lord. You both made it home. <laughs> and uh two of your children are in ministry um and the other two are walking with the lord so i mean yeah. i think sometimes people forget that but i've often used you and bill as a sermon illustration when people say how do we raise our children to serve jesus and i said take them with you when you serve jesus that's course, right that presupposes that they are serving jesus and a lot of times you know, parents are really trying to farm out that task to the to whatever the church and not be engaged in it themselves. But but in fact, if we bring our children along, that's what you did. And you, you took them right into those freezing cold winters. And yes. there was the danger of the thugs and the, you know, these mafia type guys. You had to deal with launch washing machines that chewed up all your clothing and what did it mean to take the kids with you to the store and everybody's climbing the stairs carrying bags of groceries that hardship didn't actually kill them it gave them a love for the things of god which has yes. persisted into all of their lives yes it was it was it was great they had a great childhood it was great and you know somebody confronted my daughter annie about this and they said do you resent your father because he was so gun ho about ministry and neglected you. She goes, no, not at all. I don't, not at all. She goes, there's people in America whose fathers give themselves over to making money and never see their kids because they're away making money all the time. And their kids fall away from the Lord because their father doesn't love them. She said, no, not at all. It's quite the opposite. You know, my dad loved me and trained me and yeah, showed me the way. So, you know, there's there's a term we're all using these days, and it's called a narrative. And mm -hmm. I really think, Joni, that one of the things that is on you at this time in your life, in your second marriage, in this, you know, latter season that, you know, you've, you're no longer in Ukraine, but change the narrative, because we have such an entitlement mentality in America. And 
you know, it would be easy for somebody to spin this into, yes, Bill was not a good father because he took his children into these terrible places. He was not a good husband because he took his wife into these terrible places. And yet you said there was a joy in doing this because your focus was the Lord. It wasn't yeah. what material benefit can you get out of this? Yes. The true riches, and Bill preached this a lot, the true riches are eternal and our treasure is in heaven. And you can tell what a person's treasure is there your heart will also be and you know in the in the modern science that says you know where a person spends their time energy and money you find out their true values i mean are our values the same as christ do we have eternal values do we believe that there's treasure in heaven for obedience and my daughter chrissy said you got to talk to the people about obedience i don't think bill and i did anything exceptional i think what we did was pretty normal average we just saw the scriptures and did what Jesus said. And I think God calls all of us to that. You don't have to be a missionary. I think God wants all of us to be sold out for Jesus and disciple souls. You know, Bill was on the plane going to Russia in 82. He got confronted by the Holy Spirit. He'd been trained in church planning, you know, with John Wimber, the MC 510 church planning is the best way to bring people to Christ. And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to disciple I want you to disciple people. And, and Bill said, well, of course, I always disciple people. And the Lord said, I will build my church. You make disciples. And Bill said, yes, of course, I always do that. And then Bill said to the Lord, but you know, Lord, the best way to bring people to Christ and make disciples is by planting churches. And the Lord corrected him numerous times and said, no, I will build my church. You make disciples. So I think we're all called to make disciples, all of us. It's the calling is there for everyone. The Great Commission is for every believer. It's not just for missionaries or, you know, paid professional ministers. That right there is gold right there. If we could just get everybody to adopt that one ethic, I think we'd be making it a long, long way towards reawakening the American church and the whole church in the West. Um, Joni, we we have to watch our time. We're not out of time, but I, I want to keep yeah. moving because I had some other things I wanted to talk with you about and have you share with us. Um, so these churches that you were planting, this mm. revival that you led, you, it was called the father's house. And uh, you know, it, it became kind of a national movement. And I know there was some overflow that went into other countries, uh, Russia, Siberia, which is part of Russia, what were some of the distinctive emphases that you, uh, you know, highlighted in the Father's House movement and what made those things powerful in Ukraine? Well, the manifest tangible presence, supernatural presence of the Lord would come in the meetings. And Bill brought that over from the Toronto revival. And that Toronto revival hit our church like a freight train. And we were experiencing this tangible supernatural presence of the love of God in the meetings at every meeting for 10 years. We're talking 10 years. It lasted longer than the Toronto thing. Uh, and Bill decided we were not going to go to nightly meetings. And he also realized um, the, the fervor and the zeal was so great that people would have come to meetings every day. And he realized that their family, so their family structure was suffering and he didn't want them to come to a meeting every day. He wanted them to have some time with their family, too, to build up their families. But the presence of the Lord would come into the room. And we had this very anointed worship leader who's also gone on with the Lord. His music and songs he wrote. You know, I'm a songwriter. I'm a worship leader. I've been leading worship for you know decades. He had this incredible gift. I've never seen anybody with a gift. I call them congregation worthy songs, songs that catch people catch on to and it just spreads like wildfire. Those songs went all over the former Soviet Union. It was like wildfire. And when you sing those songs, the Holy Spirit would just come down and so many things would happen and people were getting healed, like medically documented healings. Um, people would fall out under the power of God. There was laughing, a, a lot of drunkenness. And the drunkenness, you know, this culture, the former Soviet Union, they're really into vodka. And the government subsidizes the price of the vodka to keep them inebriated. And it, it really is the opiate of the people. They're not the religion. So <laughs> the, 
the, the, the drunkenness and the alcoholism was such a severe rate when we got there. Um, but they would get hit with the power of God and get drunk in the spirit and get immediately delivered from alcoholism. Wow. And, and even at the, at the, at the, um, when Bill would do the altar calls, he would pray over each person who came up on the stage to receive Christ. And many of them were drug addicts and alcoholics. And they said, as soon as Bill touched them, they were immediately delivered. And some of them were drunk and high when they were at the church and they would immediately get sober and get completely set free. We had supernatural rain. We literally had physical rain come in. I was in the worship team and we had a line. We were like a line. For some reason, we were all standing in a straight line across the stage. There was water droplets coming down and we all took a step back and you could see water on the stage. There was gold teeth, feathers, people seeing angels. My daughter, Christy, she would see what the angels were doing in the meetings. It's hilarious. <laughs> Some of the stuff she would see and demons would just, um, every time Bill would preach often, there'd be a demonic outburst. And then I was the designated, go take this person in the back room and get them delivered, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we had witches coming. The witches would come and try to infiltrate. The gypsies would come. We had uh, and the power of God was so strong. There were some gypsies in front of the hall who were palm readers. And at that hall where that the power of God was coming, they literally <laughs> came into the hall, into the building and said, we stand outside every week and we can feel what's happening in here. What is going on? You know, because they're <laughs> spiritually sensitive. <laughs> and uh, the Lord was just, it was... Um, and I think that it was the love of God that people were getting hit. They'd never seen love. It was a fatherless, the Soviet Union were parenting people. They took the place of mother and dad and they did a very poor job. And the parenting style there, people, there was no love there. A very inhumane treatment on every level of communism and communistic life and Soviet life. And so this love was so powerful. Um, you know, we had big businessmen who had great big companies with, uh, we had a produce middleman who dealt with tons of produce. He got hit by the power of the love of God. He cried for three weeks. Wow. His, who was a nurse literally thought he was losing his mind and he was going insane. He was under this power of this supernatural love just, just melted us. We were just like getting melted in this liquid fluid love, you know? So you've got manifest presence, this liquid love effect, people encountering in a tangible way the love of God, not just as a theory. Um, anything else that was distinctive about the Father's House movement? Well, Bill had a real, real handle on <clears throat> exegesis and the solid preaching of the scriptures and presenting Christ, coupled with um, a very good presentation and understanding of how to move in the Holy Spirit. So he did a great job um, explaining the scriptures, but bringing in like the school of the Holy Spirit. And so he really trained people with a wonderful balance of biblical and spiritual, which I think was uh, one of his greatest gifts. Yeah. And we did tons of outreach. I mean, we didn't just wait for people to come to our church. There was incredible outreach. I was an itinerant village evangelist. I did. I circuited five villages in the outer areas. Uh, John and Tanya, Tanya's father, did uh, one region with. He had tons of village churches. We had outreach. All of our people just got on fire, and they started going into orphanages. Uh, we were going into the schools regularly, presenting the gospel in the schools. The schools loved it. They said, "Come and help us." Uh, one of our <laughs> developed because um, the schools it would allow the preaching in the schools and see, they didn't allow that in America. And so the vision was fulfilled. It was, you could hear the gospel in the schools there. And uh, there was just a lot of it just, it was like a eruption of people getting on fire. And we saw the church as sort of like a training center to send people out and people caught it. I mean, they just caught it. They're still doing it to this day, 25 years later. Some of the people we disciple, they are still going at it, going after school souls in worse conditions than ever now during the war. And so they caught that thing of going after souls and uh, the preaching went out and um, 
orphanages, prisons, um, all over, you know, just on the streets. Yeah. I mean, honestly, everybody talks about revival. It's kind of, I always say, if you don't preach the impending revival, you need to turn in your revival card, right? Um, but everybody's talking about revival, revival. I knew when you came on our program, <clears throat> you would paint a verbal picture for people of what it really looks like, that there's a price to pay, but this is what it's actually going to look like. And so people better be careful about saying, I want revival, because you know what? You might be the one nominated to be going to the next town or village and preaching the gospel or enduring hardship for the purpose of the mission and because of your devotion to Jesus. And I think a lot of people don't realize that revival doesn't just come in and you snap your fingers and then suddenly everybody falls on their face and gets born again. That it, you know, Paul said it's through many trials and tribulations that we enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is what I'm hearing you say. You entered, no doubt you entered, but there were many trials and tribulations that went with it. Yes, yes. So, it was very, very taxing, very taxing. Yeah. yeah. Now let's talk about uh, kind of your three key takeaways. You, you had years of hardship, revival, church planting miracles but if you had to distill all of that down to three key learnings what would be those three learnings um we did a reassessment near the end of bill's life about what was the most important things and so when jesus so it's the last dying wishes of jesus the very last words and you know first mentions important but last words of anybody is very important and you know when when we were in in afghanistan we had to talk about uh your final last wishes you know where you want to get buried and so jesus is telling us his last wishes the most important things and he says all power is given unto me in heaven and earth go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is what I put in Bill's tombstone. And we realized even um, after we had done everything we did, we were reassessing, did we really do what Jesus said? And, you know, the Ten Commandments we memorize, we memorize the Lord's Prayer, we memorize the Psalm 23. But how many people you know, believers, just average believers, what are the commands of Jesus? What are they? Could you list those? Could you just spit those out from memory? And so we don't want to miss these details that Jesus told us to do. And right now, especially, there's a lot of distractions if we really are going to bring in a last day's harvest revival, whatever terminology or label you want to put on that, we have to do what Jesus said in obedience to what Jesus said. And he said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So what did Jesus command us to do? And I think we need to focus on what Jesus said. You know, I go to churches in America. I've been going, been back here. I don't hear anybody talking about Jesus's teachings. They talk about Christianity, they talk about finances, they talk about Old Covenant, they talk about examples of great heroes of faith. But let's get back to Jesus. The main things are the plain things. Remember John Wimber? What did Jesus tell us to do? And are we doing it? Yeah, I think that's the key thing um, that Bill would have wanted me to share. Well, <clears throat> that would be worthy of a whole separate podcast, just that alone. I've been studying. I, I, I know. I got, I got. So now, I do have some notes on that, which right. like, they're wicked. I could have an amazing Bill Lynch rabbit trail. <laughs> all, <laughs> all, all, all about all. Bill could really gift of, you know, the gift to talk. But the main thing I, I heard you say in all that without actually telling us what it was that he taught that we're supposed to teach is we are very distracted and we are chasing down a lot of things that have 
perhaps something to do with the gospel, but it's not right in the center of the fairway. And some of what we're focused on may not have anything to do with the gospel. It may just be purely and simply the devil's distraction to keep the church from fruitfulness. Amen. I, I believe uh, I, I have observed that. I don't want to be critical, but it's it's um, it's it grieves me. It really grieves me um, right. to see the focuses. The Jesus would be preeminent in all things. Jesus would be lifted up. We, if we're going to, it, it's got to. We got to get back to Jesus, and the church is straight away from the simple, pure gospel and Jesus Christ and uh, the kingdom of God and, um, and, and the kingdom of God uh, versus the political agenda. I mean, I've been in all these different places in the world and they all have their different, different political flavors, but the gospel works everywhere. The gospel works because Jesus, it, it, it's, you know, this is the, the key thing to get back to that. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, so let's see. Bill died in early 2020, just as COVID was landing upon the earth. And, uh, you know, we're here at the end of 2022 as we're making this uh, making this podcast. So he's been gone just about three years. What are you doing to keep your own passion and fire alive in a very different life than you had when you were with Bill um, so that you continue to be productive to the end of your days? This is a very good question. This was the one that um, I've been really. So when I first got to this new city, so I retired from full-time mission work per se. I, I'm not in the field. Um, I'm in America. I'm living in America. I live in a whole new city. I have a whole new husband, uh, quite a few adjustments. But when I got to Amarillo, I thought, wow, this is my opportunity to have this much free time in my hands to just be led by the Holy Spirit. And to see what God wants me to do. And so I, you know, kind of put out these feelers to the Holy Spirit and, you know, what should I do? Where should I go? And um, an early thing that happened in the city where I'm at, a guy in the liquor store who worked in the liquor store got healed. Um, I happened to be in a liquor store for some funny reason. Um, I don't frequent liquor stores hardly ever, but I happened to be in one. <laughs> and uh, Glad you clear I haven't clarified that, Joni. Yeah, I, I don't ever <laughs> step foot in those places, but it was a funny kind of thing right, while I was there. And this young man, we struck up a conversation and he had a severe problem with his hip. And I prayed for him right there. He was the man who worked there, young man. And uh, he got completely healed. His hip was so bad that he had damaged his liver taking so many ibuprofens. And I got to go back there a month later and he was completely fine, completely healed. And I'm, I'm trying to, you know, seek the Lord. There's some very extreme poor people um, I felt led to reach out to. And I realized it takes quite a bit of time. Uh, this one area where these people live is where the homeless people were placed by the government. There's this little section. Uh, it's a pretty bad area. And um, I made contact with some people in there and I have a relationship with them and uh, it takes time to build relationship and uh, especially with some extremely poor people like this, but, you know, I help them out from time to time. And um, right now I just got a job with uh, refugee services of Amarillo as a translator for Ukrainian refugees. So I feel like that was just a God thing. Cause I was like, Lord, I want, I want to do something useful that but I also my heart is for Ukraine so um when I get back there I'll be working and helping um you know because I'm a Russian speaker I never learned Ukrainian because Kharkiv was a Russian speaking city in Ukraine I mean I did get my books in 2019 when we moved back I was going to learn Ukrainian but um <clears throat> my old brain it's it's a little tougher doing language acquisition at this age and so um Thankfully, many of the Ukrainians are gracious, you know, that I can't speak Ukrainian per se, but I am a, you know, professional translator in Russian. So I'm going to be helping out with um, Ukrainian refugees in my city. And uh, I'm excited about that. I do a little worship here and there. I lead some worship to this grandma Bible study that I go to. So, 
Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I am still processing Bill's death and the grief. I go to a grief share class and uh, I'm kind of a late processor. And so it's been more acute in the last six months. And I've really had a, um, a tough time. Yeah, it's huge loss grief is such a funny thing and you know there's steps of grief but often there isn't any steps it's just a big mess a big ball of yarn is with a yep. big mess and so you don't know what you're going to get hit with so the holy spirit basically told me Joni, you've worked hard for all these decades i want you to be still and he's like healing me i feel like the lord is healing me i've been through a lot you know it, it does take it does does take its toll on you um all that we went through and bill it took its toll on him as well you know and um the lord told me to be still and receive healing and you know trying to think i should be busy and keep you know keep that up and he's like no i want you to so i'm really getting into the word a lot and getting a lot of um a lot of revelation and having a wonderful time in the word Actually, since Bill died, that's what I've, my my main thing was just going after, digging deep in the Word, and um, I don't know why I keep writing sermons. I have no platform to preach them, but I get some amazing things from the Lord, and I'm just going to keep keep at it. I fill up my notebooks, and you never know what might happen, though, Joni. This might be a season of rest where He's speaking to you, but you'll yeah, come out of this season, and you'll have a place to be preaching those messages. Hey, and if it's, you know, with these poor folks and um, I still, I'm still singing, you know, I, I'm a singer and uh, I'm not writing songs per se, but um, some powerful things have happened, you know, when I do sing the presence of the Lord comes and uh, not quite as strong as those revival days, but it really still, <laughs> that's been happening to me since I was 15, you know, just ushering in the presence with my voice. So I want to be sensitive to how the Lord might use me. We'll see. Amen. Well, you've got a voice and thank you for sharing with us today. Um, we'll close here only because. Uh, and everybody pray for Ukraine. Oh yeah, there we go. Pray for it Ukraine. Makes a difference. It really does. Lives are spared when you pray. It sure sounds from the news that we're hearing, like things are improved over there. I don't know that they're good, but they're improved and, the Ukrainians have certainly surprised everyone in their ability yeah. to uh, drive the Russians out of a large portion of their country. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yeah. Well, all right. Do you want to pray for us and for our listeners uh, that we would have that apostolic heart that took you and Bill to Ukraine? Well, Russia first and then to Ukraine, and that the Lord would raise up many who would follow the lamb anywhere he wants to lead all right okay yeah, let's pray father <clears throat> father I just pray right now that you would anoint people who are viewing this with isav that isav that you talked about so that they would see they would see what you see and lord that they would see the souls that need jesus that they would see the souls that need jesus and that you would touch their heart with supernatural love to be selfless, Lord, and to go after someone else, Lord. And I pray that you would break the, the bonds of um, self-consumption and selfishness, Lord, and narcissism and things that have taken over our culture that have caused us to be in, in, introspective, Lord, and so concerned about our own needs that you would cause people, you would just put that salve on their eyes to see the needs of others and to see the dying world that needs Jesus, that you would give them the glasses of the Father and they would have the Father's heart and heart for the, the people, Lord, that you have, you died for on the cross, that you love, you poured out your life's blood for them. And that they have the Father's eyes and heart, Lord, to, to love people and go after people and love them and pour out the love of God on them. Amen. 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 Well, well Joni, thank you. Thank you so much for taking some time out and talking with us. And uh, 
we can see that the passion is still burning within you. So I'm sure in due course, that's going to come to the surface and you're going to find a place where you can put your hand to the plow even more than you're already doing. Oh, I love you, Ken. You're such a dear, 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 great friend. And I'm so excited about what God's doing with you and using you. And it's a great joy. And hey, everybody, it's Cyber Monday. I think Ken's got a great deal on his discounted rates for his classes. I'm going to put the plug. <laughs> it's Cyber Monday. Just buy one of these classes. Now, Ken, I want to get, me and Greg want to maybe get, um, which class is the, the 101 for deliverance? <laughs> Breaking bondage. <laughs> <laughs> breaking bondage <laughs> okay because i was trying to to enroll in the 103 and they said no you have to go in 101 so yeah you really want it's to called breaking bondage and we have 101 102 and 103 and grant we're gonna have to edit all this part off the end because we can't have this going on in the, <laughs> on the podcast this is just us talking as friends i no, do right. great. love to do ads for ken i can <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joni. I appreciate okay. that. Love you. All right. Love you. Grant, you want to close us out? Yeah, I'll do the uh, the send off. Um, yeah, thank you. And and thanks, uh, Joan. It's, uh, I've actually heard a lot of stories from Ken personally about you. And uh, it's really cool to, to be able to, to have this interaction and hear those stories. So thanks for joining us. Ken, thank you for joining us. And thank you all for tuning in and listening. We'll be right back here next week with another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. Hey, everyone. It's Julie with Orbis Ministries. As we reach the end of the year, we realize that some of you are in the habit of giving charitable donations. If the Lord prompts you to give elsewhere, we just want to bless you in that. But if he prompts you to give our direction, you can do so by clicking on the link in the description of this podcast. Thank you to everyone who would consider donating. We cannot do this work of ministry without your prayers and financial support.